first uh, maybe introduce myself. I'm uh, Paul Fultz. Um, I currently work at um, AMD, a AMD, sorry, AMD doing uh, development for our graph optimizer for machine learning. But today I'm here actually to talk about uh, the Boost CMake infrastructure. And I've actually done some work here uh, the past couple years on developing CMake and Boost. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit briefly about some of the work, how we want to kind of structure CMake and Boost. But also, I, I would like to mention because some of the feedback I actually got from reviewers from the talk was, hey, you know, you should talk about some more general practices of CMake. So as we, as we talk throughout this talk about like CMake or how we structure things at Boost, a lot of these things can apply to like general purpose open source projects or even, even if you're building a proprietary build, you can apply some kind of the same kind of structure and uh, practices as well. So those are the kinds of things I'll be talking about. So like a brief overview. First, we're gonna discuss a little bit some of the use cases for CMake and Boost. Um, different people have somewhat of like uh, different requirements for different things when they say, oh, I want Boost and CMake. They mean one specific thing where someone else over here means something else. So we'll kind of go over that. We'll go over some of the current state of these use cases, what kind of things people currently do. And then we'll go over uh, the uh, the build structure. How how should we structure if we're going to do CMake and Boost? How we're going to structure that? And then we'll eventually look at the Boost CMake modules, which is a set of modules that we've added to Boost, uh, or, or set of modules that I've written to help uh, utilize some of the boilerplate that goes along with some of the build structure and how that helps improve it. Um, and then we'll look at like a roadmap for what we can do for finally integrating CMake into Boost. So some of the use cases for CMake and Boost. The first one, uh, usage requirements from fine package. So um, uh, this is probably a very common one that people want. They want to be able to say, hey, fine package Boost, start using that. Right now, I think they use fine modules. We'll look and see a little bit closer what's available already. Another thing is integrated builds with add subdirectory. So some people, uh, some build systems want to be able to actually build Boost as part of their normal uh, build process with CMake. The other thing is custom tool chains. So maybe some users are like, hey, I've got this custom cross compiler tool chain that I'm using. I need to build Boost for that, you know? And uh, they know how to do it in CMake, but maybe they don't fully understand how to do it using VJM. And then also for development, which seems in some ways you could look at it as crossing the line between uh, users and the developers, but since Boost is an open source project, the contributors are users as well. So they want to have an easy pro process to continue to contribute to Boost as well. So they want to be able to understand if they're adding a new source file, how they able to uh, how they're able to do that, or they're able to like um, uh, you know, if they run into a problem, they can go Google it, find a stack flow overflow answer, and they don't have to hunt down the, you know, two people in the world that understands boost build. So some of the current state of affairs here for the usage requirements for fine package. Peter Denote Move has recently added support to generate the fine package and package config actually from boost build, right? So it's not an entirely perfect solution. Um, but it does it, it it does work, but it, it it has some limitations. One, it only supports the build targets. So, if you want to ask for usage requirements for say Boost ASIO, you're not going to get a Boost ASIO target at all because it doesn't build its header only. But it will work for if you're doing a Boost build file system. Another limitation is it doesn't include any external usage requirements. So, Boost IO system is a target that does build, but if you need to link against Zlib or bzip2 along with the process, it's not going to include those requirements in the fine package or package config. So those are some of the limitations what was currently available. Um, uh, integrated builds with add subdirectory, there's not a, really actually a lot of options right now currently except for users going out and writing their own build scripts in CMake um, for what they need for their builds, unfortunately, right? Um, for custom tool chains, there is one option. 
um, that you could use for that is there's this boost.cmake file here at this URL there. You could actually take download that file, rename it, put it in the rename it to CMake list.txt and put it at the top level of boost. And it will actually build boost using CMake. But under the neat, underneath the hood, it's actually just calling BJAM or boost build, basically. And so it will actually translate some of the CMake settings over to the BJAM uh, user config dot jam files, right? But um, it does have its limitations as well because um, not all the settings that actually are provided by CMake are actually provided by BJAM. So you can run into some weird settings. One, one major thing that here, yes? Would it handle uh, alternate compilers for your platform? What do you mean by, or I guess the question was, does it handle alternate compilers for your platform? Yeah, so I've, I've, I've compiled GPT-10 on my own, and I've got it on a Linux machine, right? So I don't want to use the delivered GPT that's on the machine, which is would be the default that V2 would pick, but you can override that. Yeah, so it will work for the use case of saying, okay, use this GCC compiler instead of using the default GCC compiler. So it will read those things. It'll read the CMake flags that you've added and other things. Uh, just to add like, a, a bit of context on that, um, you can actually use CMake toolchain files for alternate compilers in the same platform. That's what we do at Snowbird. We just set everything in the toolchain file and we just deploy every toolchain file for every toolchain it supports. Yeah, so. I, I knew I did that. I do that in CMake. I was just wondering if it would propagate into, into V2. Yeah, so it will propagate uh, those settings. Um, so, yeah, and the comment was like, we have a CMake toolchain file for each of the, at Bloomberg, that was the comment for each of the different toolchains to have. And that's actually quite common in a lot of different places. You create a, a, a CMake toolchain file and you use that. This will actually transfer a lot of those settings, including compiler, CXX flags you set. There are some settings in CMake that don't work. Um, I use example CMake prefix pad. There could be other ones here. Uh, but this is actually common for most non-CMake build systems. So if for some reason you've got, you've got your dependencies installed into some local directory and you want to point CMake to them, n normally you can just say CMake prefix path equals this local directory in your, your toolchain file and it'll find your dependencies. That, there's no setting like that in BJAM. It does do some, some tricks to try to make it seem like it works. So it'll set like package config path, your system path. So if all the dependencies are found through those package config and those kind of mechanism, it will find it. But if it's not found through those, uh, you're going to have to figure out what the custom BJAM variables are to get it to set it to find those dependencies, unfortunately. Um, uh, for development, a lot of developers actually have their own kind of CMake scripts. Some of them support a lot of the use cases that we, I mentioned earlier. Some of them don't. Some of them are inconsistent. Another thing is there was a, there's been a recent effort by uh, a guy named Mike, I can't think of his last name, to add some CMake files in, in, into some of the core parts of the libraries. And those actually have some other issues as far as it hard codes where the dependencies are. So you have to make sure that they're in the same, this certain path directory relative to some of the other dependencies. So there, there's some extra things here. And as we see through some of the structure, we actually do want to decouple like dependency management from the build script. So we don't want to actually hard code pass for that. Of course, if you're doing a proprietary build, I mean, technically you can because you control the people that are building it. So you can tell your developers, hey, you make sure you always put this in this path here. But when you're doing open source development, users that d build it may have requirements for putting the dependencies in other directories too. So we can't actually have a restriction on that. And, uh, and yeah, and, and they also can be fairly inconsistent. Some, some actually provide installation, some don't. Um, so some of them provides fine package, but maybe it uses Campbell case, the other one uses snake case. So there's a lot of, um, there's, there can be a lot of inconsistencies with that. So um, the build structure here. Um, to start off, first, when we discuss the build structure, <clears throat> to get a better understanding on build structure, there's two workflows that people use when they 
build dependencies. And I would like to go over this because sometimes people use one and they don't really understand the other. So when they see a talk about using CMake, do it this way, then they're like, oh, I don't really understand that because at work we use a totally different you know, workflow to bring in the dependencies. So the first one is the install workflow. And that basically uses pre-built binaries that have been installed. And basically you consume your dependencies using find package, right? Um, and usually uh, this could be, they maybe define their own scripts that go out and build the dependencies themselves, install it, or they use the distro package managers, or they use some other package managers like Nix, Conda, or whatever to install the dependencies. The next workflow is the integrated workflow. This one builds the dependencies as part of the same build system. So there's some uh, users that build it all within the build system. And this is the kind of workflow that Boost Build actually supports really well. It doesn't support this quite as well. I mean, support could be added in the future, but no one's done any work on that. And basically with this, you consume the dependency through add subdirectory. So you add subdirectory with this. So people that are in these camps have found like through discussions on the boost mailing list that seem to be very strongly one side or the other, like a VI versus Emacs type of argument. And there's some advantages and disadvantages to each of them. Like the, uh, the, the advantage of like the install workflow is you can easily deal with different build systems fairly easily. Um, so if not everything builds with CMake, it doesn't matter because you just run whatever build script they have and install it into the directory and then you can use it. But uh, one disadvantage I could have, if you're not careful how you're building all your dependencies, you could run into an issue where you build this one with C++11, this one with C++03, and then you get an ABI incompatibility when you link it. And the integrated ideally can help control that a little bit better. It's not entirely perfect either because people can do crazy, crazy things like set CMEC, CXX flags variable that totally uh, throws the whole thing off. But this helps, helps control the ABI flow better, right? But rather than Boost getting into the debate of whether we should support, or even if you're writing your own open source library, rather than getting into the debate of like, we want to use, we, we, we're going to only support this workflow or support the other one, Boost CMake should support both workflows for users. There shouldn't be, we, we shouldn't, I don't think we should get into debate with that. And, and we'll see here through the build structure how we can easily support both of these workflows and still keep the dependency management decoupled from the build system. Um, another comment I would like to make about usage requirements. Sometimes when I've, I've gone to open source projects before and I'm like, hey, support these usage requirements here, I'll get a thing back like, well, I don't know about supporting all these package managers. There's lots of package managers. First thing to note, usage requirements are not a package management system, right? Um, they are about providing your usage requirements for those and they're very much tied to the build scripts because the build scripts understand the, the usage requirements for those. And the nice thing about this versus package managers because there's a new flavor of package managers almost every year with uh, C++, the nice thing about this is there's only two formats. There's actually uh, a third format that people are trying to create that unifies both of these, but it's never got really su uh, successful at all. So the main two pa pa uh, formats are basically find package and package config. Find package is purely CMake written, and you can only use find package uh, to consume it if you're using CMake, right? But it does, you don't, if, if your build system is not uh, CMake, you can still provide find package support for CMake. Uh, I mean, Boost is one example. It provides the find package files. Uh, Qt as well. It doesn't actually use CMake, but it does provide find package support for users as well. So package config is actually completely build independent. So it's not dependent at all on the builds. So for users that aren't using CMake, you know, they're doing their make files, they're doing, you know, using whatever Visual Studio, they can call out the package config, figure out their users' requirements for any any of the other build systems. So it, generally, it's a good idea to support both of these. And, and we want to be able to support both of these actually in, in Boost as well. Modular Boost. So some of this process that we're kind of reformatting some of, uh, of CMake can put us down the path that we can support a complete modular modularization of, of Boost. 
we do have some of the first steps of modularization, such as we can, uh, I mean, the libraries are in separate repos and are all tied together. There's like a super project. You can even, there's some Python scripts, I think with boost build that you can say, use this, I, I want these set of dependencies and it'll only check out like the dependencies you need and, and build it within the super project. For CMake, we ideally want to support that kind of same workflow for, especially for integrated workflow so that you could use a partial checkout of Boost. So say for instance, you just want to use Boost file system. You just pull down Boost file system and the dependency of the Boost, Boost file system. Oh, sorry. And you don't want to actually uh, bring in all the dependencies along with that. Um, also for the install workflow, we can actually support each of the libraries being installed individually, right? Um, which would seem like, oh, that completes the whole entire boost modularization thing. But it's actually not, it may not always be feasible for every single library currently, because currently boost has a lot of circular dependencies that we're going through that we're um, updating right now. Uh, they're, they're going through the process of trying to get rid of these, but at least uh, we can actually support possibly doing a partial checkout of Boost and then installing that. So if you have a set of dependencies, even though there may be some circular dependencies among Boost, you can still build that um, and, then do, and then do an installation. And possibly in the future, we can support this for all libraries. Some libraries don't actually get into the, the circle of death that Boost has, <laughs> I guess you could call it. Um, so, um, uh, you can install it. Some of them don't even hardly have any dependencies at all. I mean, I know like Boost HANA and Boost Hoff or whatever, those don't those don't really depend on hardly any libraries at all. Yes? So I think you and I had a little conversation about this earlier with Boost, but um, what do you actually consider a dependency? Because, you know, not to be a bunny or anything, but it depends on what you actually use as a lot of libraries, whether there's actually a dependency. So the, 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 yeah. The specific case that I'll give you is that, uh, this is what we talked about, daytime uses serialization, or you can serialize daytime using serialization. But if you don't include the serialization header of daytime, you don't do serialization. Yeah, so okay. yeah, so the comment is about how do we consider a dependency. Right now, we're considering it a per project basis for the dependency, because ideally, or per repo that you download, because the idea is, as a user, you download that repo and then you would run install on the individual repo itself. So there's certain defining lines. So we have an issue right now, say boost date time depends on boost serialization, but that's only because it's implementing some extra customization hooks for boost serialization. So that creates a circular dependency because boost serialization also needs a boost date time for how it serializes some, you know, in the archive and put some date time information. But there could be some other mechanism that we could use to break up those circular dependencies. We could break them up into some smaller components. So uh, a couple options is one, we could create a date time serialization module separate that provides you the customization hooks. Another option is you could create a boost serialization core library that just contains the part that you need for implementing the customization and then boost serialization has the full-blown uh, things with there. So that there's, those are another way that we could use to break those dependencies. We also have other dependencies that can be broken in other ways. That they, um, Peter DeMove has been working on this slowly at breaking a lot of these dependencies up or moving things around in other places. Yeah, yes? There's, a, there's an effort on, what is it called, Core, I think, right? Where they yeah. try to push the dependencies around so that they're... Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, there's a... Yeah, 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 they're trying to, they're, there's an effort right now currently, they're moving some dependencies around, um, or they're possibly considering creating a new, uh, some new modules too as well. I think that's what uh, some of the, when they've done this already for, this has been going on for several years. I mean, I think that's part of like some of the Win32 or boost.core libraries that were created was to try to move some dependencies around so they could try to separate some of these things. So. Um, eventually, but, but the idea is that we want to support even installing individually so that when, once they remove the dependency, the circular dependencies, then users can automatically get a full modular install of Boost by installing each thing individually eventually. So until then, 
yeah, you'll just have to do the partial checkout of boost when you hit those uh, circular dependencies. Oh, gosh. Oh, there we go. Came back up. So the structure we want to follow for boost is not a structure that I came up with, right? Daniel Pfeiffer gave a talk a couple years ago at uh, CP, C++ now about uh, called Effective CMake uh, that kind of describes the structure for how you should uh, structure your uh, build dependencies. Um, I'm going to go over briefly of what it is, but I highly suggest watching this talk if you've not to get a better understanding like how the structure. And it does a really good job of decoupling the dependency management from the build system and supporting both of these workflows that we want to support. So um, some brief um, items uh, to go over that it, he kind of discussed in his talk. I'm not going to go over everything he does. There was a, quite a bit there. But one is each project that you create, you make it standalone. That means you can pull down the project, you run CMake on it, build it, install it, whatever, and you don't need to have some super project infrastructure there to actually make it work. It runs completely standalone when you pull it down, right? Um, another thing is, is importing its dependencies with find package and fail, basically the dependency is not found. So that's an important thing too, so that that way users can put their dependencies almost anywhere and you can bring in, you can bring in the dependencies through find package and we're not like hard coding paths or other things like that for the dependencies. Uh, export uh, its libraries with a, a namespace and that's mainly just so that um, uh, when you have all these exported targets, you end up not causing conflicts with maybe other projects that may be exporting it. So in general, it's like a CMake pra practice to like add a little namespace. But since we're changing the name of the namespace that we use in find package, right? Um, we also define an alias with that in the build system with the namespace ad uh, added to it. So that that way it uses the same name as the exported package. So when users bring in the dependencies through add subdirectory, they can still use the same target that's being used from find package. The only difference is, is it's actually references the build target rather than a, uh, an ex imported target, which means a pre-built binary in that case. And then to tie it together for the, the um, integrated builds, the super project actually overro overrides find package for each of the add, add subdirectory calls that we do. So then that way, because what, what happens if you start adding add subdirectory, find package calls will be calling the same for the same dependencies, right? So he has a technique of you just override your find package and then you just call your add subdirectory there. He actually uses the technique of um, redefining the find package macro, um, which is not really good practice to override CMake functions and I don't know how long that things like that would be supported. So I actually will show a slightly different technique here to do instead that's a little bit safer, although it doesn't handle all cases, but it should handle the cases for for boost that we're doing. So starting off with an example of a boost project, we'll say a boost file system, right? Um, we, we, we declare the project here, there. Right now, I use a minimum version of uh, CMake 3.5, and that's kind of the version that's actually provided by uh, uh, Ubuntu 16.04. Um, uh, I mean, there is a debate about which version should we support, you know, between uh, for CMake. I think 3.5 3 is a good compromise between always just support the latest, latest version because some users are like, well, we can't install a new version of CMake versus supporting like a really, really old version still supporting 2.8. 3.5 has enough of the features that we need to do the, the stuff that uh, there and we use some emulation in the Boost CMake modules. We provide some emulation for some of the newer features that, that we want in CMake. So this provides a good a good balance between using the latest and not using something that's extremely old. And maybe in the future we can probably boost up it uh, uh, higher as more people switch to the newer CMakes, right? So, so when we set up a boost file system, right, you, you basically say the add library boost file system, add the source files, and then we add the include directories. Now, this is a little funky, maybe if people are not familiar with the generator expressions, but basically what this does here is the build interface here basically says only use this when you're inside the build because 
because the target we're going to create, we're going to export out, which means it's going to be used after it's installed. And so one of the issues is, is if we're pointing to something that's inside our source directory after it's installed, users can't point to that include directory. They may, may have even deleted the source directory completely. So what this does is basically say, hey, build interface, only apply this include directory for the targets if it's used within inside this build and don't use it when you export the target. Now, you could also add the include for the installation stuff, but uh, the install command that I use actually will add it, so that's why I don't add uh, another include there. So yes? So does that mean that include directory will be omitted if it's not in the build phase? Yes, so the question is whether this would be omitted if it's not in the build phase. So basically, if this target is used through add subdirectory or whatever, it will use this include directory. But once you install it and a user calls find package and then they do target link libraries boost file system, uh, in, this, in this case, they will not get this include directory. And you don't want them to use that include directory because it may not exist anymore. Does that make sense to everyone? You have a separate way of ensuring that the, that the include has their Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, for the installation part, during the installation step, because you're saying I'm installing this into the include directory, there's actually a command in the install to actually add in the, include, the, the install include directory. Um, if you remove this build interface here, CMake will actually yell at you when you export the targets because it'll say, hey, you're, you're actually referencing a directory that's within the source directory when you're exporting the target. So you actually get an error from CMake about that, and that's the solution to actually fix it. Next is define the dependencies, right? When I last uh, checked, some of these dependencies may have changed, but um, for this case here, these are the list of dependencies that um, Boost File System uses. So this, this will go through, uh, call find package on, on the dependencies to bring in those set of dependencies. And then this is kind of assuming that, uh, even though I'm, I'm jumping in the middle Boost File System, this is assuming that we've got a full-blown Boost everywhere for all the dependencies. So we can ideally bring in the dependencies and we've got these targets here that we can link in all the dependencies that we actually called out in the previous in the previous stage here. And I'm moving this in stages because it doesn't the, the whole build script actually won't fit in in one single slide, unfortunately, for not for a boost file system. Anyways. Does, does the existing build system that they use list the dependencies up there? It will list, it doesn't list all of these dependencies. It will list the ones that are actually built, like boost system, but it, the rest of these it doesn't list because these are all header only dependencies. But even if it's header only dependencies, technically you could still have extra link usage requirements. Like boost ASIO is a perfect example of that. It's completely header only, but it requires linking in a bunch of networking libraries on the system. So, um, so that's why it's good to eventually add those. Now, uh, the reason why they didn't do it originally, I'm not sure, they, actually, I'm not sure what the original reasoning was, but BGM could list out all the dependencies for the headers as well. Um, they just don't currently do that, you know. But since we're kind of redoing the build system, it would be good to actually start by listing the dependencies for every component, including the header, header only parts of it. And another reason why to do this is if you're in, because with this modular build, each of these components will actually, uh, if you're an integrated build, each of these components will have separate includes. So in this process, we're not actually moving, currently what they do is they just move all the headers into the same include, so everybody can just use the same include. But this, we don't need to do that because we have targets for all the includes, so as long as you list that, it will actually give you the includes for each of those. Or it could be the case of the users installing these. these the user could decide, I want to install these all in different directories. And some package managers actually do that. Most users probably won't do them manually, but package managers very likely will install all the dependencies in separate directories because it's easier to manage when you have them all in separate directories. So that's another important thing about listing these out because the include for this, this one and the include for that one may be completely different. So Next we do uh, part of the installation here. <clears throat> So first we install the include directory that's included at the top level CMake, and then we install our boost file system target. And then we create this export name called boost file system targets 
that will create some data structure that, that will define the targets we want to export. And then you can set the destination. Technically, you only need the lib destination, but just in case if later on you stick in a binary or whatever, it will install it at the bin directory. Here, this is where we say includes destination include, which means that any of the targets we add, it will actually add in uh, uh, target include directories for the installed include directory automatically for you. So that's one, one reason why I didn't do it on the previous slide. But that actually takes care of that. Um, <clears throat> this here will uh, take the export that we have and generate a file called boost file system targets that will actually create the target for us, the exported target for us with CNAME. And the namespace boost, why well, should put it under the boost? Colon, colon, namespace, and the destination here is under uh, libcmake boost file system so that you can call out find package boost file system and get this. Uh, uh, when you call find package, it will actually look, look for um, uh, boost file system dash config.cmake, and I'll show here in a little bit how we write that config.cmake, right? So, but there's one other slight other thing that we need to do is since we're adding boost colon colon to the namespace, First, we don't want to actually have it say boost colon colon boost file system. We don't want to have this double boost name. So this here says the export name, when you export it, just name it as file system by itself. So then that way the users, when they use it, they can just say boost colon colon file system. That's what that does. And this is the alias that uh, Daniel Pfeiffer talks about in his talk, that you build an alias for what the exported name is. So we build an alias for boost colon colon file system that alias it so that when users are calling this through add subdirectory, they can use boost colon colon file system. And there's no difference between like whether it's found through find package or add subdirectory. Now, this is part of the nasty part is installing the usage requirements. So most likely you could just, uh, if you don't have any dependencies, you could just include here, this includes that boost file system targets.cmake file here that adds in the targets that we just generated. But the targets, has a bunch of other little targets it's linking against that may have not already that may not have been found yet by find package. So we could require the user to call find package themselves, but that's not a very nice thing to do. So what we want to do is when the user calls boost find package uh, boost file system, it goes ahead and calls the find package calls for the dependencies here. So this does a find dependency call. Now find dependency really is just a wrapper around find package to make it a little bit friendlier in this context, because if find package, say find package failed uh, to find the dependency, um, you may not necessarily want to fail uh, the entire build, because if it's an optional dependency, uh, you wouldn't want to do that. Or it also sets it up to give a better information. So if like one of these dependencies is not found, when you're calling find package boost file system, it'll say, hey, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't find this package because boost range is not found or something like that. So it does provide a little bit more details. And then at the end, you can't really see the version. This actually generates a version file. So <clears throat> when you call find package with a CMake, there's actually a, a, a version dash config dot CMake file that, that is used first to find out, is this a compatible version um, there? So for this case, this is a little thing that will generate the, this version check here. So we put in the name of the version, and then for this, I say compatibility any newer version, you can select some different compatibility requirements for that, and it will check if the user is asking for Boost 168. Well, Boost 170 is a newer version, so it should be compatible. Uh, yes, Louis. It does. Well, actually, look at that with the Boost CMake modules. Right now, in the target itself, it doesn't actually keep track of where. Uh, these calls come from when it creates the targets. So even though it knows I generate this target, it's linking against boost colon colon core. Right now, uh, CMake doesn't have a way to track back and say, oh, okay, you're using, this came from a find package boost underscore core. Let me add that into this. Right now, it currently is not happening, but the boost CMake modules actually will help as far as generating these find dependency commands. Um, now, for the integrated workflow, that, that's kind of installs these usage requirements. Users can use the find package, but how does it work if, if users want to go around and call add subdirectory on these? So first, the user can call the add subdirectory. 
calls. And this is actually in alphabetical order because it actually doesn't matter what order. And it's ideally what you want when you do this. You don't want the user to try to figure out which dependencies depend on which. You just call add subdirectory here. But this is still missing a thing to disable the find package. So before you call these add subdirectory calls, you need to override find package. Now, in Daniel Fiverr's talk, he had a thing where he just overrided the macro and skipped it. But instead of doing that, I actually created this little register source package. And there's, a, uh, there's another version of that actually in the boost CMake modules. Um, <clears throat> that basically all it does is it creates a config.cmake file that's empty, doesn't need to do anything. And then it sets the, the dir for that. So when you call find package in CMake, and there's different ways you can tell where the dependencies are. Um, but one thing is, is you can use the package name underscore dir, dir, like in the case of boost file system, you can do you can set boost file system underscore dir to actually set the directory that you want it to use for that dependency. So we set it to the directory for whatever that dependency is directly. So CMake will always search in there when it does that find package call. And so then you can just go through a list the register source packages for all the packages that you have. There are a few things that this may not necessarily do. There are a few limitations. One, if for some reason, this shouldn't actually happen with boost, but you can actually call find package and force it to use a find module. And when you do that, this won't actually work, unfortunately. So, but in generally, that's something that you shouldn't do in your CMake. You shouldn't force the find module. You should use the package config stuff that's available first and then fall back on find module if it's not found. Uh, yes. And then a newer one that has, say, a bug fix or something like that, and point just that particular boost library off of there? Uh, the question is if they can use the, uh, they can have a, a version of boost downloaded and they can pick a particular version maybe uh, that has a bug fix. Like, so say, for instance, we say all oh, boost functional has a special bug fix I need. You could do that. Well, this is more for integrated workflows, but both of these workflows actually allow for you to do that. So technically, you could say, well, well, well when I clone the boost functional library, because so, like St. Francis is doing lib here, this could be in boost, or this could be actually be in your own build directory there when you add the boost. So you have a directory called lib functional. If for some reason functional has a new bug fix that you need, then you could just pull down the you know clone, if there's submodules or whatever, clone the hash that has the bug fix uh, and put it there in that directory or copy it manually, however you guys, however you might manage it in your build system. You could use this boost functional dir thing to point to some entirely different directory. That's, okay, so the, yeah, so you could use the, so that's another thing, sorry. So this is for, this is for the integrated builds, but you could alternatively in the install workflow, you could actually do the same thing. If you're saying find package boost file system, you could say, uh, boost functional underscore dir pointed to the settled directory, not to the boost directory. So yeah, you can do it in both workflows to actually point it to a different version where you might have a bug fix. Of course, Peter DeMove actually wants all the configs to actually, uh, for compatibility reasons, always point to the exact same version they're built with. But unfortunately, that would prevent that at use case. So I'm not entirely supportive of that. His thing is concerned with ABI compatibilities. You install a newer boost functional, but boost file system was built with a different functional. You're going to get an ABI failure with that. But th I think that's something a user can diagnose at that point. You know, when they start pulling in a newer version and things start failing, like, oh, okay, well, maybe I need to rebuild the entire boost rather than just pulling in this replacement. So, um, so the boost CMake modules, um, are a set of modules that, are, uh, that I've set up to try to help some of these build scripts. It seems like a lot of boilerplate that needs to be written, especially for the usage requirements. Also, I don't even generate the usage requirements for package config yet, is a, which is another thing we want to support. Um, so uh, these are supposed to help with, with these kind of build scripts and reduce down the boilerplate, and we're going to take a look, closer look at, at that. Another thing that we wanted to be able to do is make it external for users outside of Boost. So it's not just like an internal Boost thing that, oh, hey, use these internally for Boost. We're doing this, this weird thing. No, it's supposed to be 
available so that other users of Boost can use the same process that we're doing to generate these in their own CMake. So ideally, what we'd like to do eventually is maybe upstream it because um, you know, rather than Boost maintaining these separate set of CMake modules, we could actually possibly up, upstream it eventually uh, once we kind of settle on what we want to do into CMake, and CMake could help maintain it. So when they come out a new version of CMake, if something breaks, uh, CMake maintainers will take a look at that and figure out what's going on. And you can actually get these Boost CMake modules at Boost CMake slash BCM. Right now, the BCM stands for Boost CMake modules. They're currently named BCM. Um, in the future, it may, through the formal review process, it may actually end up changing names or something. So who knows? Um, <clears throat> so some of the overall features, uh, auto-generate requirements. Um, as, as we say, there's a lot of boilerplate for that. But some other things, too, is high-level test functions. So right now in, in CMake, if you want to do the test like we do in BJAM, you've got to kind of create an executable. you got to add a test command that runs the command and things like that. So this is kind of trying to combine some of the test things together. It provides a... Our path emulation for tests on Windows. Windows doesn't actually provide our path capabilities, which is uh, the compiler flag that's used on Linux to tell it when you're building shared libraries, um, like where those shared libraries should be found. So it actually does, it has a little bit of an emulation. So when you do the test, when you run tests with, with Windows, it will actually still you find the correct shared libraries that are needed on your system. And then there's also some, uh, yes? Go back to the test one for a second. Okay. So does it actually generate a C test uh, statements? Is that what you're actually doing over there? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that's th we'll actually look a little bit closer, but basically it is calling add test, which is the function that is used for C test. So it's actually generating those same C tests. It's not going down a different path. It's just taking care of some of the bullet plate. I didn't actually show it on the previous slides uh, for the test for boost file system without a boost same make modules, but we'll actually look at uh, kind of what it does um, because when uh, when we were presenting when I was presenting some of this to boost CMake list uh, for writing the test I mean I, I remember the uh, maintainer of uh, uh, boost config uh, what's his name John Maddox. John Maddox yeah he basically looked at it and was like I'm losing the will to live basically when he saw it so <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like okay we're gonna have to we, we can't just have it just say hey just run these couple of functions so I'm like we need some kind of high-level in, uh, uh, infrastructure and actually having these high-level instructions actually allow us to be able to do the second part which is the R path em emulation otherwise you have to go down another path I, on a lot of projects what they do usually is they say we're gonna put all of our shared libraries in this one same directory and then when we run the test we're just gonna set the environment variable manually so that we get this so this, this will actually take care of like that step so you don't have to go through this extra step and it can kind of work more naturally and then the last point the language properties um, boost build has a lot of things that you can turn off different language features or compiler features such as warnings RTTI exceptions and a lot of those are needed for the testing infrastructures inside of Boost. So some of those aren't completely supported in CMake. So uh, Boost CMake modules actually provide some of these properties again. So Boost, uh, they can do it. Um, so uh, to use the Boost CMake modules, uh, uh, you can call, uh, basically, after you install it, right, you can call find package BCM. There's no special, like, hard-coded CMake, you got to override your CMake modules path or anything like that. It may it basically calls find package BCM, which will, um, which will basically update your CMake module path to actually find these uh, modules so that you can turn around and say include BCM deploy include BCM setup version. So going back to the example that we used for Boost file system, right? Um, this is kind of I have some dot dot dots to kind of compact it down uh, basically what you do um, you there's a setup version here that you can use to set up and this this setup version sets up the version in CMake um, which I didn't actually show in the original one but it also sets up the that write package version thing it also sets up that to write out for the package uh, for the package names when it writes out the package name it use, actually uses the project name as the default so it uses kind of heuristic of whatever you set the project name 
it'll do that. There are overrides. So for some reason, if you name your project one thing, but you want to find package something else, you can add a name parameter to these functions to set a different package name. Um, we add the library. We still add the export name, because we still want to do that correctly. But we don't actually add the alias, um, because the uh, VCM deploy actually takes care of us. It takes care of adding alias for that. And I'll go into more detail about that. We also add the include directories here. But instead of doing this whole build interface thing like that, we can just say private include, and we just need to add it for our private build or for the, the internal parts of building it. Because the BCM deploy here has an include as well for the include directory. And it knows I'm going to install this into the include directory. It will add onto the interface part of the targets. It will add the, um, the, the source directory for the, when you're doing an internally build, and it will add the install version of it. For, for when you uh, for when you install it, so you don't have to go through like those extra steps. You just need to add it for for it private, and that's a little bit cleaner for people to see than sometimes using some of the generator expressions. I think um, so. And then what deploy does here is it will install. It will do the install step, installing it. It will also install the usage requirements for fine package. It also installs the usage requirements for package config as well, and it does a couple of extra things too as well. It also provides an alias for what this exported name ends up being. It goes ahead and provides the alias for that exported name that you need for the, um, for, to, so that people can consume it with that subdirectory. So it takes care of a lot of that boilerplate. And one of the key things that I was working on with those CMake modules is we don't want to go too far of an extreme to, uh, to do these where it doesn't look like CMake anymore. Um, some people are proposing some more higher level DSL that can help reduce even some more of this boulder plate. But the concern is, is you get to the level where people don't see ad library, they don't see target link libraries and things like that. These are the stuff that people are familiar with and these are the things that people are going to manipulate. So these ones we want to make clear and still use regular CMake for. But for the rest of this part of this boulder plate, we're just, hey, deploy it, you know. And those are the parts that usually users are not going to really want to actually have to update generally ever at all. So it, it helps keep it with a familiarity with CMake. So adding test. So this is the part that I skipped with the boost CMake modules. So when we add test, there's actually an extra, this is, uh, this is something fairly recent. We actually have an add test subdirectory. And the reason for that is we want to be able, be able to control what subdirectories we add for the test because they can bring in a lot of extra targets. If the users don't need tests in there, we don't need to add in the extra targets for the test. Um, it just ends up bringing up extra time for CMake, especially for Boost. It's a really large project, so it has to generate huge amounts of CMake code. It has to run over when it configures. So the reason why we have the add subdirectory is it provides a capability uh, for users to just to completely disable adding in the test completely, right? So. Um, adding test dependencies. So once we go into the test, this is in, under the test subdirectory. At the very top, we include the BCM test module. Then we find package the test dependencies. And here, we actually add in test link libraries, which in this directory scope, it will actually add in the dependencies you need. So first thing off the bat, it will add boost file system, which is the, which is the test we're building for. Because obviously, all the tests ideally need to use boost file system. And then these will add the extra dependencies that the tests need as well. So all the tests will actually use those set of dependencies. Otherwise, every time we define a test, we're going to have to add in the dependencies every single time, right? So, and this is only, this is not global. This is directory scope. So it only applies to the, the directory, the test directory and any subdirectories of that test directory. So, and there's also a way you can disable it too for a specific test. So, these are what the tests look like for boost file system, right? Um, uh, you can have a name here. And what the name actually does is that defines the name for the test and the target as well. There's a, there's a corresponding target that actually gets built. And, and then these are the sources that will get added to the target as part of the build. And the reason why it uses the same name is if you need to go in and add some extra, you want to add some extra compile options or whatever, you can actually say target compile options refer to that name there to add it. Or as another example, you need to add test properties. 
Um, there's a bunch of other test properties uh, that you can add with, with CMake. You can actually say set, you know, test property for the name of this test there, and you can set the property. So it's not entirely opaque what this does. You, you can still get access to the targets in the test there. Um, this is kind of cut off, but this is actually says compile only, actually there. Um, and this basically, you can actually do compile only tests as well, and it even supports doing the compile fail tests that are really common inside of Boost. So the name is actually optional. Another thing is the name is actually optional. So you can actually remove the name technically, and it just makes up a, a random name for the test um, as well. And I guess for these cases, the name's not actually needed. But I think these names are actually copied from the BGM files. So let's look a little bit more in detail about some of the stuff we do for that. That was kind of like a high level overview. So in Daniel Pfeiffer's talk, a lot of, a lot of the stuff that we were doing is, um, or a lot of the stuff that he mentioned was, when you focus on modern CMake, you should focus on targets and properties, right? And not so much variables and directories, right? And so for us to carry data structures around, we don't really use variables. We actually use custom properties. And you can define a custom property here. I think originally CMake had this for documentation purposes, which I don't really fully understand how that exactly worked. But th this is the reason why you have this brief docs, full docs thing that you have to define for every single property, right? But you can set the type of property here, which says target. So there's three type of properties in CMake. There's global property, directory property, and target property. And you can make it inheritable so that when you set a directory property, global property, the targets actually inherit those same properties. So this does a simple property of interface dis dis description here. Um, when we are doing, and there's a lot of properties that actually have interface uh, underscore prefix on them. And part of the reason why is because when we do, when we actually are using the interface targets in CMake, which are the, what we have to use for when we're doing header only, right? It has a requirement, it has a whitelist on these are the only properties you can use, right? So that, you know, obviously export name is one of the properties you can set on an interface target. But one of the other things they do allow is any property, even custom property, if it's prefixed with interface, you can apply it to an interface target. So even though some of it may not make sense in the full what they mean by interface and CMake, we still have to prefix it with interface so that at least we can apply it to an interface target. So um, hopefully that makes somewhat sense. So <clears throat> we want to be able to auto-generate those fine dependency calls that we saw on the earlier thing. But what we need to do is we need to be able to take the target, find the target where it came from, what find package call. So what we want is we want these like set of properties here that say, hey, these are the these are where these find package calls commands was used to actually create this imported target. And there's an issue right now currently with CMake open up to uh, uh, that for to add this issue uh, or add this feature to CMake. We don't currently have it, so we have to do kind of like an emulation. So we do override add library, which is not always the best idea, but I'm hoping it's temporary until we can get this feature added to CMake. So when you overwrite a macro in, in CMake, you can do underscore add library here, uh, which we'll call the original add library function. So we forward it and we just call the original add library function. But we check to see, hey, is this an imported target, right? If it's imported target and there's the CMake, so CMake defines these uh, variables when you're inside a find package call, like, find CMake find package name. So what we're going to do is check are these is this variables are these set of variables defined? If these set of variables are defined, we're going to take those variables and add them to properties on the target. So in this case, we don't actually we have to prefix these properties with interface unfortunately so they work for the interface targets. But basically we'll set interface pack, find package name and the rest of these required exact version. All these will loop over those and set those as well. So then, so basically, this will automatically allow for the imported targets from find package. It will have these set of properties that we can use, that Boost CMake modules basically will use, so it can generate uh, the find package calls. We also have some properties for package config, because it also generates the, uh, 
the, uh, the, the package config usage requirements. So basically, uh, uh, package config has the idea of a, a description and URL, URL field. So you can actually add those properties there on there and it will read those and fill in those if you want to. Um, it also has a requires that there's some set of requires that is not uh, well understood by CMake itself. And then it has a, a package config name that tells it the name of the package config that this target actually needs to call to get the usage requirements in, in package config. So then what we do is we auto generate the dependencies. So we run through when we generate the target, we'll run through the target of the dependencies and we'll read this package config name and we can add that automatically to the requires clause in package config uh, or yeah, inside the package config config file so that it will generate the corresponding package config there. Um, we also want this available for downstream dependencies to automatically be able to use this package config name. Fortunately, when CMake exports targets, it only has a set of properties it exports. So it won't actually ex export the like interface package config name. So we run over some properties during our, our uh, boost CMake when it generates the config.cmake. It'll actually add back those properties on the exported target. So those will actually be available when you call find package, um, like say find package boost file system. It'll have the package config name of boost file system so that it will know that it can generate package config and refer back to the package config boost file system, right? Now for test, um, <clears throat> so the test, actually there's, a, uh, there's some uh, structure that I actually set up with this. There is a test target. Now technically you can build all the tests using C test directly um, if, if you want to, because it just builds it through the C test, but it actually provides some targets to make it a little bit easier for users instead of having to run through uh, there. So it builds a test with an S at the end because it can't actually do test because that's reserved by C test. Um, these actually build the test. You can also do tests for a specific project name, especially in Boost. If you've got all these Boost modules that you're building, maybe you just run around the test for Boost file system. You don't really care about, you know, Boost core test. So you can actually just specify the test. This only builds the test. It doesn't run it. So there's actually a check target that will actually build and run the test. And it has a corresponding project name associated with it. Then we have a property, enable test property that uh, that basically controls that add sub uh, test subdirectory. So you can control whether it um, it adds the test into the subdirectory. And then build testing is a variable that CMake uses in the C test to decide whether you want to build the test. And right now, currently, what it does is it it decides whether it's going to add the test to the all target or keep them separate that the user can invoke separately to build the test, right? And there's some other things that add with the build testing. We'll look at later. So the CMake command for uh, creating the test is the BCM test like we saw before. We have the name, we have the source files we list. You can also do content. So you actually build a test completely from a string in CMake. So if you have some way of auto-generating some build script test, you can, you can do that as well. Args are the arguments because it builds an executable, runs it. But if there's some extra arguments you want to do for the test, you can tell it, hey, add these arguments, right? Um, compile only means it's only going to compile the test. Uh, will fail will say that you expect the test to fail. So using actually both compile only and will fail, it will actually enable you to run the compile uh, the compile fail test that, that's common in Boost. Um, and then there's no test lib. So uh, the BCM test link libraries uh, brings in some brings in dependencies that are automatically added with every BCM test. But if you do no test libs, it will actually exclude those dependencies. So if for some reason you've got one special test that's like, I don't want these dependencies, I want to do something special, you can actually skip those, right? So the BCM test link libraries that we saw, it's directory scope, right? And it can be ignored with the, the no test libs, like I was saying. Um, there's a couple other things with it. When build testing is off, it will actually ignore the targets if they don't exist in the project. And the reason for this is to allow uh, someone to do a partial checkout of boost and still be able to build the test. Because if the target doesn't exist, it will fail at CMake time, not at build time, unfortunately. So this will allow it to fail at build time. 
So for example, you, you want to pull down the dependencies you need for boost file system and the test dependency, right? But you mainly want to run, only, you only care about the test that you want to run for boost file system. You don't really care about the test for boost thread. So there may be dependencies that are mess, missing with boost thread. You don't really care about it. You just want to ignore it because you're building the dependencies with boost file system. So when build testing is off, um, it will allow this extra thing. But ideally, if the build testing is on, it assumes that you're building all the tests in the entire project. That's why it's added to the all target. That assumes you're building all the, all the tests. So it will actually check to make sure the dependencies or the targets are there at CMake time rather than at build time. So basically, if you tried to build, like, say, boost thread and you pull it, uh, and it's missing some of the dependencies, it would just basically um, basically just fail at build time and fail to link or something like that because some of the dependencies are missing. So, um, yeah, all the targets that are added to BCM test uh, link libraries are actually added to the test uh, the, to the test project name. Um, and the reason for this is when you're when we're doing compile only tests, the way it works currently in CMake is the test is actually going back and invoking CMake and telling it to build a target. But if both of those targets actually depend on the same dependency, say for instance, both of the targets depend on Boost Core, and maybe Boost Core hadn't been built yet, you're going to run into this like race issues in CMake. And one of the usually what happens is one of the tests end up failing and saying, oh, I can't find this dependency. So there are options you can actually call, uh, there's ways you can manage these dependencies by saying, oh, it, you know, serialize these tests and other things like that. But there are quite a bit of compile only tests to make everything to be serial. So we still want it to be parallel. So the, the solution to that is just, hey, add the dependency to the test, which will be built first. And so by the time we run the check, all the dependencies to the compile only test are already built. So, so we can actually run concurrent uh, or run the test in parallel, even the compile only test. So, <clears throat> we also have a thing to test headers as well. So you can say header here, and that that um, that that's actually the include line, not necessarily the path to the header file, right? Um, by default, it just it just builds a, a executable with one include. But if you do static, it'll actually include it across two translation units and bring it in, link it again, which is useful for finding if you've got like duplicate symbols or something like that in your headers. For setting the R path, right, um, we basically, like I was talking about before, we basically have to emulate some of the R path settings um, uh, by setting the system path during when we run, when we actually run the test. So we collect, to find out what the R path should be t t uh, added to, we actually collect the R paths during the when you, whenever you call BCM deploy, and we set path. We actually set the path variable for test on Windows, but we actually set wine path if you're cross compiling, uh, because if you're cross compiling and running your test inside of wine, it will actually still work correctly as well too. Mainly because I do most of my testing on on Linux, so <laughs> for Windows, so that actually makes it work as well. But it does it will work on the regular Windows Visual Studio. So to actually add the R path, we have a add R path function, right? Uh, we actually generate. There's two files we generate. We generate a pre uh, pre set R path pre version that basically calls the set R path variable, and then down here we append this pre version with the, the appended R path. But this doesn't use generator expressions. Ideally, we want to use generator expressions. The reason why is because when you're dealing with Visual Studio builds, uh, when you refer to the target, there's actually two different paths where the target actually is, depending on whether you're doing a debug, uh, a debug version or release version. And uh, so to distinguish that, you have to use generator expression. So this, this thing up here basically takes that pre-version here and outputs a R path version based on each config there. And we iterate over all the configuration types. So that's basically what that does. And then inside BCM deploy, if it basically checks to see if it's an interface library. If it's not an interface library, it goes ahead and calls this target file dir and it adds the target, um, the basically which is the directory for the target. And that generator expression will take care of figuring out uh, whether it's running under debug or release uh, under Visual Studio. Because um, generally on the Linux, when you when you run under debug and release, it's actually a different configuration of CMake. 
but in our Visual Studio, it's actually built both at the same time in the same build directory. So because of that, that's why you have to use the generator expression. So. And then when we go through, this is, this is basically what it does. It generates a CMake file that it will run for the test. So this goes through, uh, checks if it's cross-compiling. It calls out the wine path to figure out what the path should be when you're running in wine. Otherwise, it just prefixes the R path to the environment, or it, well, it includes the set R path first, like it's R path variable, and then it just prepends it to there, runs the command, basically. If it fails, it'll say test failed, right? Um, there are some more properties that we add. These are some of the, the language features of properties that we add. We add uh, for enabling the same exceptions, RTTI, warnings, and warnings is errors. Um, <clears throat> and these are actually used throughout Boost testing infrastructure, right? So this is a thing that I actually got from Niall Douglas to be able to add these, uh, these features there. So basically what it does is depending on the compiler, it checks the compiler that you're using, it calls an add compile options at the very top level. Um, but it doesn't add, it's, uh, it's only going to add these compile options if the target has this property set to like on or off. So if the target has the CXX exceptions to off, it'll actually disable the no exceptions. Um, uh, and, and it has some things for the warning, so it will set the flags here. So this actually only sets it per target, even though this is add compile options, which is considered. Yes? Uh, just a minor nitpick. Uh, there is a generator expression for the compiler ID as well to test it. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to do the if statement. You can just add all the properties with the compiler ID in the generator expression. Uh, yeah, the comment is using, you could use the generator expression with that. That is way much more uglier uh, for the generator expression. It's actually much cleaner just to put an if statement at the top for the compiler yeah, ID. It's not going to work if it's not a GCC-like compiler. Well, I, well, technically we can say else if, I mean, this is a simplified version of what's in there, but technically you would check to see under the else if this is a GCC or claim compatible compiler at CMake time. There's not, there's not a need to do it at, in generator expressions, really. You can just do it here and just add the, add the generator expressions that you need based on the compiler, because it's not going to change after configuration, um, is the way it does. It's actually a little bit more, this is simplified for the slides, it's actually a little bit more complicated, because uh, this is like not case sensitive, so there's other generator expressions that you can make it not case sensitive and other things like that. So it, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Adding the compiler ID would make it even more complicated for that. Um, so, but this is a thing that I got from Niall Douglas to be able to do, and then this is how we add the, add the compiler features on there. We also, because of the test link libraries, we actually have to test when, before we link it in, or otherwise we'll have a compiler error, we have to test whether the target exists. And we actually have to do it at generation time rather than configuration time because we don't know if like another later add subdirectory will add the target name or not. So there is a, on newer CMake, there is a thing called target name if it exists, generator expression that you can use uh, to detect whether that target actually exists in CMake or not. On older version, and that was added just recently, when I started Boost CMake modules, this didn't exist. So to support like CMake 3.5, we use a emulation using shadow targets, basically. And the technique of this is we have basically add a property called uh, tar interface target exists. And we'll use that property to decide whether the target exists. So there's two functions, a notify, and then a query function that asks if it exists. On the notify, right, you want to notify and say this, this target exists. On there, it will first, if the, if the shadow target doesn't exist, it goes in and creates the shadow target. Um, and then it sets the property on the shadow target to target exists one. On the query part here, it basically says, it does the same thing because it has to check, you don't know whether the shadow target exists. So it always creates the shadow target. And in this case, because you're just querying it, it assumes that it says the property is not existing here. And then for the out part, this is the generator expression. We know by the time you do this generator expression, this target will always uh -huh. exist. And then it just queries the target uh, for that. So th this may be queried first in the CMake, but it may be later on somebody will call shadow notify which will then flip the, the, the property from zero to one. So, and the way you use it would be, this is all together in one example, but basically you add your library here, 
Mm-hmm. You then notify, you notify the shadow target that A exists. And then later on, which it could be in a completely different project or a completely different uh, CMake subdirectory, then you go and query, you know, if that uh, target exists. So this says has, well, this says has B. It really should be has A. I guess it's a typo. <laughs> it doesn't really make sense. But basically, uh, this will create this variable that will have the generator expression that you need that it will tell you whether the target exists. And basically, then inside your uh, compile options, you can say, add in this define for have B if, the, if this uh, has B basically generator expression returns true. So this kind of abstracts out whether the target exists. And newer CMake, this can actually be replaced with a target name if it exists. And it reduce down a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, targets that get generated. And then inside B, BCM deploy, we go ahead and notify. So no one needs to actually run the uh, notify thing since we just notify the shadow targets that the target exists. So that just happens internally um, there. So let's talk about, uh, OK, we got about 15 minutes. Uh, path towards integration. So we've got the Boost CMake modules. The first thing we probably need to do is we need to do a formal review process of the CMake modules, get a review manager. I know at one point we had Daniel Pfeiffer that was going to actually consider doing there, but um, I don't know what situation he's in now currently, but I remember at the time we had to get like permission from some VP at Apple to be able for him to actually be the review manager. I don't know if that's still the case or not. Um, but we want to be able to do it. Some of the people I think have uh, have mentioned that they might be interested in doing the review manager uh, for the Boost uh, CMake modules. So the first thing is, is get this the, through the process of review. I think at one point I actually wanted to show a full demonstration of, of the latest version of Boost maybe with the Boost CMake modules as just kind of demonstration so people can see. But I'm realizing that is a lot of work that I don't really have time to do with at this point. So. Uh, but we can still <coughs> do a review over how the, the CMake modules work, make the updates necessary, get it integrated and boost. And then the next, we can start updating uh, the CMake modules. Rather than, because I, a couple years ago, I did a full thing build of boost with the boost CMake modules and everything. And my plan was, oh, yeah, I'll just, when they come out with a new version, I'll just update the thing, it should be fairly easy. It turned out it wasn't quite as easy as I thought. There's lots of changes that happen every time and it, it ended up being a lot more work than I realized. So I'm not a, I've not been able to actually keep that up to date and it, there's a lot of dependency. So rather than trying to do the full blown to update everything in, in, in Boost, um, we can actually take like a layer by layer type of approach. Start at the like level zero dependencies, Boost config, Boost preprocessor, things like that. Um, update those, then go to level one dependencies, boost the cert, um, uh, and some of the other dependencies, and start getting those con uh, converted over to CMake. That shouldn't be too much work. And then as we start growing it out there, um, uh, uh, more and more dependencies can use it. Uh, one key aspect of this is we can't just jump in and say, hey, boost serialization, I want to use the boost CMake modules because it requires you to say find package for your dependencies, and those may not actually provide CMake files yet. So uh, we need to start at the core part of it and start building it up from there. One other note is we do need tests. Some people are focusing on saying, hey, we'll just add the integration just to build scripts, and we can worry about the test later. Test later. But uh, going through the process of actually converting the entire boost thing along with uh, the test actually showed a lot of problems when I added the test with my build scripts. I had source files that were missing for certain configurations that needed to be added. There were certain dependencies that were actually missing or defines that needed to be defined with it. And so the tests were actually able to show me those issues and then I was able to go back and update it. Otherwise, we may have these build scripts and they may work when, you know, for, you know, when you're on Linux or whoever decided to write the build script, but when you switch it over to a different platform, uh, it may not work for some of the features. or or rather, the build, uh, the, maybe some of the libraries will work, but some of the, the libraries may not have all the full features that they need, that they're required. So rather than us, like, um, rather, than, rather than us putting out, a, if we're going to officially push out a build script to CMake, we need something that works. And we also need to test because as we upgrade there, we need to know if developers are making update and they forgot to update the CMake, 
we need to have a mechanism to know that these build scripts are stale. Somebody needs to go and update them, right? So the tests will actually provide a mechanism for that. Although the tests are fairly expensive to run on, on Boost. I think it takes like a, on a on a 32 threaded machine, it takes like an hour, an hour and a half to run through all the tests on just one configuration. So um, ideally, we probably need test machines or something else like that to run these CMake. So there, there is some infrastructure. Yes? Well, you, you're, I'm sure, aware of the test infrastructure that is available. Mm -hmm. um, there's yeah. a lot of testers, and I'm sure, and there's a separate boost test list that you can get on um, mailing lists. And, and actually, yeah, I mean, I guess that'll be an interesting question to review. But anyway, you know, somebody might want to adopt the CMake testing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wonder what other things there are, right? Because it produces this massive XML and all this stuff and it uploads it. And oh, okay. Yeah. Um, this is the thing. Yeah, yeah. It's all those web pages I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I am aware of some of the test infrastructure, but we need some volunteers to say, hey, we can, we can use this test machine just to run the CMake test and maybe even update, it, find some mechanism to generate the XML to update the test on, on uh, there. C-Test will actually export out an XML format for it. Um, it's not the same X XML format that Boost, Boost testing infrastructure uses, but at least it can export it out and we can write some Python or whatever that convert it over to what we need for there. So just to be clear, many of the Boost test machines are volunteers. Yeah, yeah, There exactly. are some that are provided by the organization. So we can talk later. Or, or oh, yeah. Time. So you should be able to get access to this, I guess is what I'm getting. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, my hope is, I mean, there seems to be a really strong interest on on from people for Boost CMake. It seemed like back a couple years ago, if somebody mentioned CMake, as far as anything, it turned into 100 ma emails coming out every day, basically because of this huge discussion with it. Um, it seems to calm down a little bit uh, since then. But... Um, the but but ideally the hope is is if there's these companies that are actually rewriting their own build scripts and they know hey we can rely on boost to do that maybe they might be willing to you know volunteer some test machines so that we're we're testing the CMake infrastructure as well um, so yeah um, future development for this um, one thing is enforcing naming conventions for tests this is something I'm considering. Uh, one of the issues with test, with the test and the targets it create, is all targets in test and CMake are global. So, if one Boost library decides to make a test named Checklib, and another one decides to make one called Checklib, it'll just break the CMake, and there's no way to really control it, right? Or it may not be completely obvious to both of those developers that they're breaking each other's test cases, right? Um, so one way to do that is to have some naming scheme to do that. Um, the only way I see really is when you call the BCM test, enforce some naming scheme like, you know, maybe it starts with project name or test project name or something like that so that that way it's kind of namespaced off into some separate area that won't interfere with, with Edel tests and different projects. Yes? Yeah, so I guess in our project we uh, do something similar to that. So um, every subsystem uh, test setup has, you know, if my subsystem is, you know, INF or something like that, I'll prefix it with INF underscore and then the test name. And that, yeah. that is also helpful because if you want to run individual ones, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like all the INF tests, then I think you can say uh, INF star or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you can, um, so, yeah, so the point is, is that they, uh, at their system, they actually do something similar with a naming convention, with a project name. If you do the naming scheme, you can kind of glob uh, it uh, with the project name. But actually, to support the, the, the check dash project name, what this does is when it actually adds the test, it actually adds a label with the project name. So you can actually do dash L and uh, filter by the project name actually already in, in the Boost CMake uh, system. But, um, but Ideally, we want it mainly just so that we can kind of prevent two developers from conflicting with each other. Um, ideally, it would be nice if you could just make this naming scheme internal and they're not aware of it, but I don't really know of a, a clean way to do that at all. Um, because ideally, we want to 
we want to make the test and the targets kind of transparent a little bit to the user so that they can you know add in new properties or change certain things about it so another option is possibly disable installation um, some users especially if they're using the integrated build they don't really care about installation so they, we have a way of disabling the test so they don't have to worry about the test but it may be they may like to disable the installation that you know we don't need to generate all these package config files you know whenever they run CMake so there may be a good option to have a thing where we just disable all the installation or have a property that you can disable it for certain certain directories and that the BCM deploy will basically go through and remove or basically will do nothing it'll be like a no up when installation is missing so uh, another option is parsing the BGM test files in CMake um, so I, I, I actually have a Python script. When I did the conversion over, I had a Python script that I could run a BGM file through and it would generate the CMake test file, right? Which is nice, but some of the developers may not want to actually support both a BGM version and a CMake version for the test files. So um, it may be a good, uh, we may be able to have an option where we can actually, in CMake itself, you could just point it to a BGM file. And if you're using the high level test runner, there's two different test runners is more like a low level one and then there's like a high level one if they're using the high level one we could possibly parse some of that in most cases now once they start getting into cases like add this to client or do this other thing it may get a little bit um, trickier so we may have to have some kind of mechanism so that you can the trickier parts you can define twice but the the general purpose things you can you can just uh, read it directly from the BJAM file and I think uh, a lot of authors may actually prefer that. Now, some of some of the CMake or some of the BGM test files just like glob a bunch of .cpp files. So for that, they I mean they can do the same thing in CMake if they want to. So, but I think this some developers that uh, may prefer that instead of maintaining two separate uh, files. Um, the other thing is a uh, an intermediate file for listing dependencies. Um, some people have been discussing the mailing list uh, previously when I talked about some of the stuff is having this intermediate file. I think Peter Demo when he tried to dissimer, uh, demonstrate some CMake version, he actually used this intermediate file. His idea was he was going to use his uh, boost depth thing that he has to actually generate that because he figured developers are not going to want to update it. Um, it also has the advantage of like maybe certain other tools may want to actually read that file. Currently, if you want to figure out what the dependencies are for a boost, you just go into the CMake, parse the find package. But uh, it sounds like some developers want to not even touch CMake at all because they're like morally opposed to it. So they're like, I, I don't want to touch these CMake files that you've added. I just want to parse it from this other file. So <laughs> there might be some need for having an intermediate for files for listening to dependency. I don't know what kind of format it is. The only, the only issue is, is that when you start doing this, it starts looking less like CMake people are familiar with is the only issue with there. In some cases, it, it can be a little bit more complicated because you have optional dependencies like Boost IO streams. It can still build without Zlib. Um, so you may want to actually, how do we express that? So there's some open discussion how we list those dependencies. But it's very likely if we had a mechanism to list the dependencies, though, we could actually create scripts for users that say, oh, you just want boost file system. I can read this file, figure out what the dependencies are, and just pull down what you need just for boost file system, rather than the users having to manually do this. There's some Python scripts that already do this uh, using the boost depth tool that Peter Demove has. So there's some Python scripts that do this already. But this can read it explicitly, so it's not out of, out of date. Yes? So we, we just released recently a CMake parser library that would be able to, like, Gather the, the include libraries from the CMake files. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they actually have a library they released that actually can gather these uh, uh, libraries automatically. So that's written in Python. So that that is an option you can do. Um, but uh, some user was saying like, well, we shouldn't have the list of dependencies in CMake. It should be an independent format. So that's the only reason why I mentioned that. But uh, that is a very good tool because, yeah, you could very likely just read these. Now the dependencies are explicit. We can read these. And when users want to just pull down just boost file system, we can actually just pull that down for them, you know, and set up a, um, we could even have it set up the super project for them 
um, for that because right now we still have circular dependencies, so there's still a super project that might still be needed, but we can actually have the tooling and infrastructure possibly in the future to do that. So um, lastly is auto-generate recipes for various package managers may be an option in the future. So various package managers have, uh, I, I guess it's really common for package managers to have recipes, Conda, Nix, Conan, you have to have this ex extra recipe format with it. So it may make sense that we could write tools that can generate these recipe files from Boost so that we're not manually having to do it. So we can keep these up, things up to date in different package manager that people are using. So that might be a possibility. Yes. Do you support the documentation tool chain at all? No. That's uh, that is another thing. I not completely familiar. There is some CMake that was written, uh, I think like a decade ago by um, a guy named Troy, I believe something yeah. that uh, did some of there. Um, so that we can invoke the the thing. I would like to add documentation in the future as well because I didn't listen. This is more like short term uh, thing, but in the long term, ideally, I would like to switch over and actually have a thing where we can invoke different uh, documentation. Right now, the goal, even though I'm focusing on tests, the goal is first let's get something that users can build and solve the use cases that users have currently using CMake, um, which does require tests to actually make, ensure that we're doing it correctly. But the documentation doesn't necessarily ensure that we're doing that. Later on, uh, yeah, ideally I would like a way that we can basically have some modules that will generate the boost documentation tool chain. So there. From, a, from a development, boost development point of view, this isn't going to replace BGM. Not, no, not That's at this point. Not at this, this point, yeah. yeah. No, maybe in the future as we expand it more, Maybe it could replace BJAM, but ideally, if we're parsing BJAM test files, <laughs> you know, I don't know how well we're going to uh, replace the BJAM as well. Um, maybe in the long term, we could start looking for that. But first, let's try to get infrastructure in place so we can actually start building CMake. Some developers are all okay. I know, like the uh, Peter Demove and Glenn Fennis. Yeah, he um, he's they're they're on board. They they have no problem maintaining two build scripts for the libraries they maintain. Some authors are, you know, completely opposed to this. So that's why we may want to do something like that as well to do that. But um, it, it may take a little while for us getting support with CMake that, you know, as we move to there, there may be, we may actually begin to snowball the effect and we can get more support added for CMake and maybe we can start looking in the future, like how do we do the boost documentation tool chain as well. That would actually be something very good to be able to add. Um, so, so maybe that's a good library in a week, perhaps next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe have some. I mean, my assumption is this will just be an extra CMake module that we have in BCM that can go in and add the the documentation commands that users have. And now we've got different documentation tool chain. Now we've actually been actually moving away. So this is why it would actually be a very interesting project because not everyone's using the boost documentation tool chain. They've moved over. There's that ASCII doctor that's uh, a lot of new libraries have added. I know my library boost hop. I actually use Sphinx. Um, Hannah uses just Doxygen directly. So ideally we'd have seeming modules that users can, I mean, or the developers can just call these out and run these tool chains automatically. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always been the case since the very beginning that there was never an official tool chain. It's just that a tool chain arrived that uh, did sophisticated things when Doug Grigger wrote it a decade ago or whenever it was. Yeah. Uh, but hardly, yeah, I mean, it's, it's chaos, basically. Yeah, yeah. Always has been. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's actually my last slide. I'm not sure why it's not showing up. I'm supposed to say questions here, but... For some reason. Yeah. So my question is more practical for currently. So with Boost 170, there were some changes that went into some of the various libraries for CMEX. So I'm wondering what the current advice for users today that are already bringing in Boost into their projects. And right now, they can't use the default way. They can't use their, their CMEX scripts because there's incompatibilities. Like, so the kit where CMake, the boost bind package, isn't giving um, its overriding those, so you're not getting a lot of variables that you're used to using. 
Okay. I think they're working on fixing some of that. This is one reason why it uses a different, it doesn't use the fine package boost directly with the components because that's a totally different path. Um, this is trying, because it's a kind of slightly different approach, this is, you actually call fine package boost file system. Um, ideally, I think we want to generate a boost config, and I think Peter DeMove is working on it to try to make it as closely compatible with it as, yeah. as so possible. What, so what kind of device would you make for the people with the packages to try to make use of boost the only way I know of is to basically, when I'm doing the configuration, just to say, like, ignore boost C or something like that. There's, there's some macro like that you have to use, basically, then you use the kit. Well, uh, yeah. So if you're, because we support the, the, the imported targets now, you should just be able to actually then update your boost system to use the targets rather than the variables, unless there's some variables that are not, that are needed besides just the targets. I think before a lot of people use the variables because uh, the variables uh, worked with newer versions of boost where the targets were only, like if you want to use the targets and you upgraded boost, you'd have to upgrade CMake along with it. So a lot of times people use variables in their build scripts. Now that we support actually creating these targets, you can actually use the, you can switch over to using the imported targets directly, which is a, probably a good idea. And, and that should actually future proof it for future developments with Boost, um, which would be good. Later on, when we start getting this infrastructure in place, possibly there may be another migration. But the, the idea is that hopefully we want, still want to support the, the component-based fine package as well, too, as a backwards compatibility. So, yeah. There is a, another detail there, which is if you have a config module, a config module takes precedence over a fine module. So as long as you get, like, the new... Boot no, no, no. Actually, fine modules actually take precedence. But what happens inside the fine module, a lot of fine modules do it, they'll turn around and call the config module in itself and just exit out because it's like, oh, I found the config module. But fine modules actually are found first, actually, in CMake. So if you look in the boost config uh, or the find boost.cmig, you'll see a thing where it says find package boost config, and it will first call the config one. If, if that's successful, it'll actually just end it, and it won't do anything else. So that's how that works, actually. Um, and the reason why they do that is because, say, for instance, you do have a config module that's broken. The find module is a way to handle upstream dependencies in your library where maybe they aren't set up correctly. So the idea is you put in the find module to override the config thing so that you can make it, uh, uh, you can mo do modifications but on it, but yeah. So yeah, any more questions? Yes. I don't remember the name of it, um, but for the shadow, this the shadow targets. Yeah, shadow targets. That that generator expression of the target exists. Is that in CMake now? Well, uh, which one? This 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 here. The target name if exists. That's in that's that's in the latest version of CMake. I think the last release version that they did, they added this. This is fairly. Uh, three dot one two, I think is the latest version that was added. I think it's 3.11 or 3.12, something like that. That that was added. So, yeah. But when I originally wrote this a couple years ago, this didn't exist at all. And I had a CMake issue open of that. So if they had not added it, there would be an old CMake issue on here, like like it was for the fine package usage requirements. So yeah. All right. Any more questions? I think we're out of time or